little late, but I'm, you know, we'll see how we go for time. Obviously, if anyone has trains to catch or whatever, and we're running a little late, please, you know, feel feel free to sneak out. We we won't feel insulted, I don't think. Sure, when you feel insulted? No. You you feel, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I recognise that you know, as we get towards the end of the afternoon, one or two people may need to slip away. That's fine. Don't feel. I dare move. Um, if you need to go, we'll, we'll, we, we, we understand. First of all, I can't believe we're getting nearly at the end. Um, uh, it's been humbling for me, to be honest. But maybe we'll come back to that at the, at the very end of things. Um, so anyway, we come to our final session, um, looking at Bresson's great unmade film, Genesis. Of course, there are other unmade films. Um, we talked about the Prince of Cleves and Loyola, I mentioned that old and I know there were one or two other films that they had planned or thought about, inevitably projects we toyed with for a while. But Genesis, I think, was the great abiding passion and obsession in the, the, the latter part of his life. Um, and we corresponded about it, well, you write to me occasionally, about it. I'll just read a couple of clips to show the trajectory, in a sense. Um, in May 87, he wrote to me, at the moment I'm preparing Genesis, and first the creation, where I have serious problems with the wild and other animals, I may have to give up. And then the 17th, September 87, a bit later, I believe that I'll have to give up definitively and sadly, very sadly, the creation, not having sufficient possibilities with trained animals, and so give up what follows through to the deluge. So I'm searching in my head for another idea, which I haven't yet found. Of course, we know he didn't go on and make another film, but I know that uh, Genesis was a uh, yeah, project so close to his, um, to his, to his heart. It's, Great that we're looking at this particular uh, unmade film. And looking at unmade films is always interesting, and this one in particular. We've also talked over the years in the Bresson lunches about films that were made at years after they'd initially been written. So Lancelot, written in the 50s, made in the 70s, and how that changes things. It's so easy to think that filmmaker decides to make a film and out it comes, and it's boom, there you go. But uh, there are decades of agony and contingency and, and all that stuff, as some of you, some of you will know. So, anyway, it's a real pleasure this, this final session we have. Uh, Tamsin and Richard and, and Sean Burr dealing with Genesis from, from different perspectives, but I'm sure in, in dialogue with one another. Um, so I should just briefly introduce uh, uh, the first two presenters. Um, so you, you know, I'm sure you've all spoken to Tamsin and Richard, my, my co-chairs. Um, Tamsin is a bookseller, publisher, bookmaker, and owner of Tender Books, a space for exper experimental publishing, uh, as well as for exhibitions and events in central London. Cecil Court. Whatever passing Cecil Court, there are many great bookshops there, but Tender Books is the, is the finest. It's a, it's a stunning space, so do visit and buy books. Um, Tamsin also makes beautiful artist books with Richard under the imprint Setsuko, and their books often relate to cinema history and iconography. They both ex exhibited their work as installations in London, Paris, and Tokyo. Um, that sounds like Chanel, doesn't it? Well, that's you know, you're in New York. Um, <laughs> I'm big in Belgrade, but uh, you're much more glamorous. Uh, Richard, who I, you know, you, you all have met, is an artist and filmmaker, currently associate professor at Richmond. He screened and exhibited work across the globe and has received, received numerous grants. So I'm not going to name them all, but as a semi Welshman or married to a someone who's Welsh, I will mention he won a gold medal in fine art in 2016 at the National Estead Fire. Lovely, at Wales in Newport. So um, it's a real pleasure to hand over to pair of you. I've seen some of this work years ago. I'm so excited to see that you're always doing yeah, fantastic stuff. Over to you two. There we go. All right. This is Richard. Time's in. Um, we're going to tell you about our discoveries over the past five years. We have quite an unconventional method of presenting, so it may not be the slickest we have practiced. But, um. It'll definitely like wake you up at the end of the conference. Okay. So yeah, so our talk is called Footprints in the Sand, and it'll become apparent why in a second. Oh, this is so confusing. Okay. So um, yeah, so we've been collaborating uh, together under the name of Setsuko, named after Setsuko Hara, for over 10 years now, and we've been making artist books. And I think it's just useful to explain what an artist book is um, before we start, because what we're showing you now will eventually become one. So an artist book is a book that is an artwork in itself, not a book about art, it's a primary art object um, and that's what we make. The ones we've made have been connected mainly to sort of film history or little works in film history 
So there's a sort of picture biography of Setsuko Hara, a zoo for Chris Marker, and then a kind of look at um, the remake of Breathless, starring Richard Gere from 83. Okay, so this is um, a spread from our first book on the Japanese actress Setsuko Hara. Um, and it's a kind of, um, it's a nice way of illustrating what we do. Um, our books are very much composed around images and um, having the images relate a kind of narrative or a story. Um, and these images relate to very intensive periods of research that we carry out. Um, we also very interested in the relationship between the form and the content and the, um, the form of the book being an, an extension of the content in some way. So, for example, with the Setsuko horror book, we were really fascinated by these um, Japanese icon books, which kind of take like a, a movie star and it's mainly images and very little text. So we really kind of fell in love with this form of the book. Um, and our like weird method of presenting today kind of relates to our um, digging into Bresson and looking at archival material and the fact that the book that we're working on will actually be a kind of almost like a dossier or a notebook of these kind of various um, attempts or anecdotes. Okay, so um, like all good projects, this one started in the bath. Um, I was reading Bresson on Bresson, like everyone when it came out, very, very excitedly. And um, this uh, this uh, interview, The Beaten Path, uh, with, uh, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this properly, Pierre Ajami, uh, from La Nouvelle Literie, uh, from uh, May 66. And this is uh, an article when Balthazar um, has just come out. And uh, Bresson's been asked about that gap between um, Joan of Arc and Balthazar, why was, it, why was there such a gap? And in, in this article, there was a, a small section, I thought I knew quite a lot about Robert Bresson, and so did you. Um, and there's a small section where he mentions that he's spent six months in Rome with a team of 30 gardeners building the Garden of Eden. So I was literally in the bath, very, took a photo of the book very excitedly. No, damn, damn. <laughs> we can do something with this. And it, it kind of outlines this project where he was working with someone called Dino De Laurentiis, who we'll introduce, um, and is very like upset that the project has fallen through and feels like he's wasted his time. So um, actually in the notes of cinematography, there's a reference to this. Um, a kind of very enigmatic reference as well, um, typical Bresson reference, um, that he had these like idiotic discussions in Rome and he had to leave very abruptly. And we were like, okay, so there's something here that we need to definitely dig into a little deeper. So that was like the starting point for researching. Okay, and if anyone has Googled Genesis, they probably found this quote from uh, Bernardo Vitellucci who uh, tells the story that he was present uh, in this meeting. Uh, Bresson allegedly had taken all of the animals from the zoo in Rome to a beach to shoot for Genesis. And uh, when they were watching the rushes back the next day, uh, Dino De Laurentiis was furious because Bresson had only shot the prints of the animals in the sand and there were no shots of the animals. Uh, this, this, like, any, you know, the initial research was all, all about this, basically. This is a, I think it was like the 10 greatest movies never made uh, kind of anthology. And in that, they sort of recounted that story. And someone um, had made this kind of poster even for Genesis, kind of thinking about what that might have looked like. Okay, so <laughs> we started our research and um, most people, when they begin their research, they might go to a library, you know, they might go to an archive. We actually went to Rome and went to the zoo. <laughs> um, and we ended up looking at the animals and thinking about, oh, maybe these are some of the animals, like the ancestors of the animals that um, Bresson was, was taking to the beach. <laughs> and we, we ended up making these photographs of like the footprints that, around the zoo of the animals. Um, but this was actually a very useful time because um, we kind of, we're thinking more about the project and we actually made some other discoveries that were really important for the book too. 
So yeah, we were there and we kind of used it as like a mini residency. We've got a system where we, because we both work, we only meet up once a week and we've been doing that for 10 years, every Monday to work on our project. So sometimes you need a bit more time to get stuck into something. So we use the trip to Rome to really start to like dig into it. Uh, as much as I would really love to believe that story from Bernardo, I suspect, I'm, I'm, you know, might, maybe it's not true, uh, but we started to find kind of concrete uh, evidence. And in fact, one of the things we managed to get our hands on was a, a script uh, or like a sort of script treatment for, uh, for Genesis. This would be from the, the kind of later attempt um, after Largent. Okay, so this is um, a really serious starting point. Um, so Dino De Laurentiis had this idea to make an adaption of the Bible into a movie. And he wanted to make it as a portmanteau film. So he wanted to cast like various directors, like the biggest, hugest, most serious names of the day. And they would take a chapter each and it would compose this like epic film basically. So this is the kind of lineup that he assembled. So we have from left to right, we have Mario Chiari. Obviously, there's our man, Robert Bresson. Uh, Christopher Fry, we have Lucina Visconti, we have Orson Welles, and there in the back is Dino De Laurentiis. But also, apparently, there was Bellini was going to be involved too. So it's, yeah, it's quite a it's like serious. like a super group. Basically. Yeah, like a super group, exactly. <laughs> Um, this is a really amazing discovery that we found when we were in Rome. Um, one of my favorite images of um, Bresson going to kind of schmooze with the clergy. <laughs> um, so he's meeting them um, and we actually found out that he screened Joan of Arc, which was the previous film that he'd made, but that was a kind of way of like trying to get their blessing or quite probably their financial support in his his own endeavor so and i guess um quite a lot of people here have seen this um particular interview which um we're going to sort of read out a part of where he talks about uh, genesis okay so this is 1965 with francois Virgans. What about this film about Genesis that you were supposed to make and never did make? This is Google Translate, it's just really dodgy. <laughs> uh, there was something marvellous for me. It was about doing what I never wanted to do. It was to make a movie first on a large screen, a large screen with colours, and then to try and ex express that it felt when I think about the creation of the world and this extraordinary moment when life appears and the jolts of life uh, appear on earth and even the way Adam and Eve came after that whole creation which was achieved with them and they found everything ready and take the dramatic aspect of the relationship between Adam and Eve the stories of Cain and Abel these stories the first murder the responsibility of Adam and then the flood the first drop of rain which falls and which is the first drop of an overflow which is going to be the start of all horribly dramatic things which is this flood and the Tower of Babel <laughs> yeah, I thought of this Tower of Babel, which had been pictured from the outside with more or less imagination and talent. It would be interesting for cinema to show it from the inside. You know that this thing is much more striking when it's not seen from the outside. I imagine 300 yards of a tower seen from the inside like a tomb. And also I imagine the voices at the time, when tongues start to collide to cross, to oppose each other. This would be amazing to hear with the echoes of an enormous tube. Very good song. <laughs> okay, so another very important discovery. So, how a dispute about making Eve black almost scuttled Bible movie. So this is um, another amazing story um, about uh, Bresson's casting of Eve or his, um, his intentions for how the character of Eve would be. Um, so this is um, an African-American culture magazine called Jet, and they ran this story um, in 1966, which would have been 
maybe three or four years after um, Russell's attempt. When uh, the eventual film that did get made was made, which didn't involve Bresson. So the, the article um, outlines uh, a sort of clash of uh, ideas, really. And um, it describes how Tamsin, Tamsin, how Bresson wants, to, um, <laughs> wants Eve to be historically accurate. He wants, wants to find a non-actor. And it outlines a kind of journey to North Africa, the Middle East, to Egypt, a casting process. He had cast Eve, and then the publicist says Eve must be white to sell the film to America. And Bresson quits the project in protest and is like, I can't do this. And I, well, we've, we've uncovered more since, but this seems maybe more plausible than the footprints in the sand. Um, and there is some, you know, there's an, in, a, a, an important document, I think, that also supports this. Dino De Laurentiis actually went on to realise the project and I think made one of the worst films I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> uh, sorry, John Houston. Um, and uh, I think if we look at Eve in this eventual film, I think that, you know, it, 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 it chimes with what is being described. Okay, so this is the Eve that, um, <laughs> that finally profit appeared in, in the John Houston film. Um, and this is a Swedish model called Ulla Bergrad, and she was literally just cast from a photograph. She never acted again. Um, but I'm, we really love this photograph that we found because it's so non wrestle Like if you consider her nudity and the way she's posing so like, the actual key post. Um, yeah, so it very much supports the fact that she was a blonde Swedish model, <laughs> supports this story. And I, I think this is really, really interesting to see. So um, you can imagine all the further clashes, you know, De Laurentiis and Bretzel might have gone on to have later. This at the time was the world's largest billboard in Times Square, uh, made to announce the Dino De Laurentiis uh, was going to make the most important film of all time. You imagine Robert sit standing next to him. <laughs> <laughs> so an another amazing journey in our research is that we went to um, view this archive in the Paris Cinematheque, um, which holds a mini dossier of documents relating to Bresson's attempt to make Genesis. And if anyone is able to go to Paris, I would so recommend it. They're very generous with letting you view the, the material, but it's absolutely incredible. Um, so, it, and really very detailed as well. So we were surprised to find notebooks, documents, photographs, in general, a very exciting moment. Um, the, these documents are actually all attributed in the archive to Pierre Chabonnier, the North of Bresson, um, which is, Really interesting. So Pierre Chavonia, as probably lots of people know, is a longtime collaborator with Bresson. In the, the Affairs Public credits, his name is there, and his name is still there years and years and years later. It seems that they had a very strong bond, a very strong collaborative uh, relationship. And those that those years that Bresson was in Rome, it seems Chavonia was there with him the whole time. And lots of the notes we're going to show you would have been and drawings would have been Chavonia's. So this is one of my most favorite things is um, Charbonnier's drawings for the, for the little scenes in, that they were going to shoot. So we have the creation on the left hand side, we have the Tower of Babel, we have the Ark on the mountain, we have the Garden of Paradise, obviously, and the, the desert. But yeah, these are so beautiful, these little sketches, I think. It's like the first storyboard, <laughs> <laughs> the only storyboard for press on <laughs> <laughs> so this is um this is again like um an example of how like detailed this um this dossier was so these are all um a huge long list of plants that they used to create the garden of eden or that would have been the final garden of eden it's all their plans with different um flowers and plants that they would use and even some um contacts of like florists and places they went to buy the plants in rome 
um, and like budgets as well. Yeah, budgets and yeah. yeah. And then we've got some uh, really kind of amazing things which start to kind of really illuminate what Genesis might have looked like. So this is a is a shot of a small, imagine a small effect of Tower of Babel, seen from the outside here, which is contradictory to what Bresson says and his ambitions. But um, yeah, it's a concrete thing we can start to imagine. And it looks like they're almost like blocking out their shots here as well, aren't they? They're not just photographing the modules. Similarly, um, a model, a very small model of an arc resting on a suitcase. Again, you can see that the you know, figuring out their framing and how it's going to be shot. Um, and then I think uh, the most important information in there in terms of continuing our research is this. And these are, there's, there's quite a few pages of these, but these are contact sheets which show the casting of Eve. Um, and you can even see, it's a bit hard to see here, but Bresson's on set with a camera shooting 35 minutes. So there is film material of, of this. Um, and again, if you look at uh, the ethnicity of the potential Eves, completely supports this narrative as well that we found in Jet magazine. Um, what is really important is clearly in all of the pages, one of the Eves, potential Eves, is, has got an X. So we know exactly who was cast as Eve. Well, not who she was, but we, we've got an image of Eve. And here she is. Um, very different to the Swedish model that we saw earlier. Um, and you can see it's it's so much a dress on Eve, you know, the, the way she's very modest in her pose and the way she's attired. It's a really, really beautiful image, isn't it? Um, and then uh, there's, there's a series of images where Bresson is with, with Eve on set, where they're, he's directing it, they're obviously shooting material. I would imagine maybe these are screen tests at this point. Um, so they're in that garden of Eden. Yeah, yeah, that's very, very exciting to find. Um, another thing that we really liked seeing was um, Bresson and Charbonnier wrote down um, some kind of visual references for how they would make the scenes and um, some kind of source material that they looked to. So um, there was a list of painters that they, they were interested in. So uh, Poussin, uh, Rubens and Bruegel in particular. So one of the paintings reference, we probably, lots of people have seen this one before. This is uh, Bruegel the Elder, the Great Tower of Babel from uh, 1563. And I think, especially seeing it in this grainy black and white view, you can, you know, we can start to project, can't we? Um, and we can start to imagine what, um, Genesis would have looked like. And this is Raphael, building of the Ark, 1515. This is uh, Pier uh, Piero uh, della uh, Francesca, and this is one of his frescoes from Arezzo. Uh, apparently, the most beautiful painting in the world. Okay, and then. Most recently, this is in January this year, also in the um, also in the Bresson notebooks, it actually identifies the site for Eden, which is very, very exciting to discover. Um, and Eden is um, in a place called the Villa Shigi in Aritia, which is just outside of Rome. So eventually, after being cancelled various times due to COVID, uh, we actually went and visited Eden uh, this January. This is a photograph we took there from looking down on it, and it is a vast uh, expanse and looks very much like the kind of landscape we see in the back of those casting images. We also, um, uh, thinking about those lists of plants, we also started to gather foliage and we took a scanner with us and we were scanning all of the material that was present in a way of like sort of combining compiling like some sort of visual list. Another really interesting discovery um, 
is uh, this is a shot from um, the Leopard, 1963 by Lucino Visconti, and this was also shot at Villa Shigi. Um, and if you think back to our original lineup supergroup shot, who was in that lineup but Visconti, and that was 1963. So Presson and Visconti were maybe down the pub having a, you know, having a glass of wine. Oh, I've got this nice place where I'm filming. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. I know we should build Eden. <laughs> okay, so we're going to end uh, the talk uh, just by that most of the material um, was from that early 60s attempt at making Genesis. And we're going to sort of finish today by returning to that point after Largent where he's thinking about his next film. It's Jonathan started us off with. Okay, 1983. No, but there's a film I'm hoping to make that I've been thinking about for a long time. I wrote quite a lot about Genesis, the beginning of Genesis, which is something I'm very interested in, but it's a much more difficult film to make, much longer and therefore more expensive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. That's absolutely fascinating. I'm sure there were a slight lot of questions and, and discussion. Um, so our next and indeed final presentation of this uh, conference is uh, from Sean Burke from the North Dakota State University, whose title is The Biblical Poetics of Robert Bresson. Uh, Sean is the Chair of the Department of English and Associate professor, professor of Religious Studies and English at the North Dakota State University in Fargo, North Dakota. And he writes on biblical poetry and on the reception of biblical literature in contemporary art. So, uh, Sean, bring it home. Is this microphone okay? Um, thanks everyone for sticking around. Um, uh, and if they, I guess if you're um, really into the idea of hearing about a movie that never existed from a, um, uh, a Bible scholar who lives in Fargo, which is a place that maybe only exists in the movies, um, uh, here we are. Great. Um, uh, and just uh, thanks everyone. Uh, this has been such an incredible experience. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. Um, I, I just love meeting you all. Um, thanks, Jonathan, for such wonderful hospitality. And thanks to Tamsin and Richard for like, just the, uh, I, I don't know, like enthusiasm just maybe out, uh, for your project, maybe you want to be here too. So yeah, so cool. Thank you. Um, my, my clicker. Okay. So here we go. Um, so at the midpoint of the flood story in the book of Genesis, uh, we see Noah come to a realization that the waters are about to recede. And Genesis 8.11, as I have on here, um, quote, notes, um, and, the, and the dove came to him at the time of evening, and look, a plucked olive leaf in his, in its beak, and Noah knew that the waters had abated from the earth. So this word I've translated, and look, is hine, which is a Hebrew grammatical particle of the cut, of the reorientation to a new glance. Um, it's often translated here, so I could translate it like, um, and the dove came to him at the time of evening, and here, a plucked olive leaf. It's the word that's in the here I am of uh, Moses becoming aware of the burning bush in Exodus, and it's the here I am of um, both Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22 as they answer the astonishing divine call to human sacrifice. Um, it's perception being reoriented in like a crystallizing little moment. Um, and up to this point in the narrative, Noah, who is one of Genesis' most like indelible characters, hasn't uttered a single word. Um, we don't get any like discursive access to his uh, consciousness through voice. Um, Genesis gives us objective, sort of externalized judgments about him, his character calling him blameless in his generation and righteous. Um, but it's all interesting that also when the text does open the door to Noah's consciousness, it does throw so with images and objects, this leaf and a beak. Um, in the words of uh, one biblical scholar, I'm um, drawing upon Robert Kawashima, um, with a handful of words briefly representing Noah's consciousness, the writer is able to su suggest all that spare twig signifies to its hero. So, okay, as this loop of this clip here um, from the uh, Procès de Jean d'Arc already kind of hints at, I, I want to try and draw a connection between the formal and thematic concerns of biblical narrative in Genesis 1 through 11 and those of Brisson's films. And some of this has already been named by Tim Cockwell, and it's, it's uh, unfortunate I was, I was not able to meet him. Um, uh, so scholars of biblical literature, uh, going back through the work of Robert Alter and even to the formative mid-century, 20th century work of uh, the Jewish German exile, Eric Arbach, 
have observed a distinctive style of the biblical narrative that is like that's paratactic, like the and 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 even here you see the ands, and also this hine, this like these paratactic moments. It's also it's a style that's elliptical and uses a spare objective exterior description to conjure sort of surprising depths of interiority. Um, Eric Auerbach, in the introduction to his famous book Mimesis, he um, contrasted the externalized style of Homer and the Odyssey with the spare techniques of biblical narrative. So uh, Auerbach describes biblical narrative this way. Um, Far from seeking, like Homer, merely to make us forget our own reality for a few hours, biblical narrative seeks to overcome our reality. We are to fit our own life into its world, feel ourselves to be elements in its structure of universal history. The spareness of biblical prose in which everything remains unexpressed uh, is not the absence of style, but a prose form which draws one inward, which is, uh, this is another quote from Auerbach, it's fraught with background, or it maybe even fraught with interiority. And I think it's important to note that like, um, biblical narrative is not, is not sort of plain on uh, literature, right? It's, it's uh, Bill Quinn, there's some really cool scholarship about how na uh, narrative is a, is a great innovation of world literature and, and, and it happens in the Hebrew Bible and it postdates poetry. It's doing something different. Um, so the style here is like both paratactic and elliptical. Um, you know, similarly, um, Rasson describes his style as that of quote, someone who likes, dislikes ornament and excess, who likes what is stripped down, naked, I know that electricians have to strip the wires in order to join them if they want the current to flow. And elsewhere, we saw this quote earlier in our presentation today, the ellipses, the gaps, are where the poetry slips in. This is by Brisson. And it's also important to know that, like we all know that uh, Brisson's films are, uh, are like, um, they're not a cinema of like simple sensations or surfaces. It's not these postcards, right? You know, um, uh, and he insisted that cinematic image comes from the, makes the movement from the exterior to the interior. Um, you, know, you know, theatrically informed performance, the found in mimetic kind of cinema uh, is in Brisson's view about a falsely created exteriority. And the cinematic image, by contrast, is about interiority. Here's another quote of Brisson. Interiority, intimacy, isolation. In other words, death. So I want to try and think about Brisson's legendess in terms of the affinities between his films and biblical narrative. Um, uh, these convergences make you want to approach this mystery as a sort of reader of the Bible. Like what drew Brisson to Genesis? What might he have seen in this text? And yeah, sure. Okay, Brisson's attraction to Genesis is surely in part like, attributable to his lifelong Catholic identity. Um, and yeah, and some early career films take place in expressly religious frameworks. Um, I, but I do think it'd be a bit of a mistake to, to review Brisson's Legendes uh, uh, in, in terms of primarily in terms of these early career religious films. Um, in fact, I think there's a greater affinity between Genesis one through eleven. And as mid-career later, more secular films that are bleaker or more lucid about humanity in its terms. Um, and I think one can, one can see parallels on the level of form between biblical narrative um, um, in Bresson's films and throughout most of his filmography. Um, but the thematic parallels, however, I think do perhaps cluster in those later secular films from, say, Balthazar onward. Um, as these mid to late uh, films, uh, they, they, um, they leave the constricted spaces of the earlier films. They leave the convent, the bourgeois drawing room, the stifling Paris church prison, uh, and they go out into the wild, wider world. And, and, and that way they begin to echo the concerns of the biblical book of Genesis, like a little C Catholic and humanistic, humanistic perspective. Um, so Genesis chapters one through 11 is, I think is a reasonably, I'll just, here's a quick summary, if you don't mind. Um, it's a reasonably uh, self-enclosed text that scholars sometimes call the primeval history. It's before Abraham, right? It's the world history. Um, uh, you know, one single moment tends to occupy Western conceptions of the text, which is the Garden of Eden, um, but the narrative rather is a kind of ancient anthropology. Um, uh, yeah, it's a story of human transgressions, um, but it's even more an account of what it means to be human. Um, humans coming to be in an already given world, which they are not the center. Um, the, the loss of, the, of life, the tree of life, which is paired with the gaining of the knowledge of good and evil, which is like coming to age of reason. Then there's transgression followed by the first sin. And, and the first sin is Cain's, not Adam and Eve. Um, and the spiraling of that sin through humans' descendants. And the depravity that leads the divine attempt to uncreate the world in the flood, followed by God kind of give it backing off and giving up. Like, okay, you're, you're just who you are, we'll let it go. Um, and then the creation of human civilization, right? So, okay, all right, um, back to Brisson, all right? I'll, I'll show some pictures in a second here. Um, one major like thematic trajectory in these later films of his, again, starting with Balthazar and so on, is of the widening impacts of human sin, uh, a parallel to which can be found in Genesis 1 through 11. Um, 
So with this, with this in mind, I think it could be kind of fun exercise to look for traces of the Genesis story in his extant films. Um, like Le Genesis was never produced, um, but maybe what I want to suggest is like maybe it was already made or it already exists, right? Um, uh, and so uh, I want to start with some images that are Edenic, like it's close to Eden here, right? So, or at least as close as Brisson gets to Eden, right? So like, uh, so, so on Femme Douce, we have like this film, which is all about the vast gulf between present and the lost past, right? Um, in this film, we have like a bereaved widower who, who searches and fails to find meaning in his wife's death by suicide. And we have flashbacks reconstructing the relationship, sometimes with these bright memories, such as this one seen here, which is like um, uh, in the earlier relationship with this sort of giddy and joyous sex scene, right? Um, and this moment of joy, though, is sort of suffused with melancholy. I mean, to be human is to be in a world of transformation and loss. Um, and in the book of Genesis, like Eden is, is that which is like forever barred from us and with the flaming sword of the cherub, right? Um, okay, so parallels with the, the Genesis are even, even more robust. Um, also in uh, this sort of signature film on the human condition, which is Balthazar, right? Um, in, in this film, Balthazar tra silently transverses a world teeming with human vice and the vicissitudes of faith. I mean, we could also redo Eden in this uh, opening scene here, in which the two children, Marie and Jacques, um, so they find and name and baptize Balthazar. And here we have the naming of the animals, right? Um, but later, Marie, uh, now a teenager in the garden late at night, is approached by the sinister hand of a boy named Gerard. Um, prior to the scene, you know, we meet, see Gerard with, with friends leering at Marie. And I think, I, and um, I'm sorry, this, this is I, um, uh, Sarah and Sarah and Elise and Richard did this much better with the feet and the hands. But here, here's uh, Gerard's hand coming here. Okay? And this is like the, it's very certainty, right? I mean, it's very um, and so, you know, um, you know, later in this film, Marie gets entangled with this relationship with Gerard, which is like abusive, but still oddly compelling to her. Um, uh, staying with Balthazar, I think this film is driven by the sort of shifting and numerous hands through which the donkey passes, the hard driving farmer, the drunkard, the circus owner, and the, the, uh, the cruel and greedy Miller. And this scene here shows Miller uh, pushing Balthazar's aging and broken body to a breaking point, right? Um, notably, I think this passage here um, uh, that I quote here from Genesis chapter 6, is um is just before the precursor of the flood. This is sort of the breaking point of all humanity is nothing but e evil all the time. And this scene of the, the whipping follows by rain and uh, with dark, dark clouds and just pouring rain out to the door. I mean, like, <laughs> there we go, there you go. Genesis. <laughs> okay. um, um, <laughs> all right, so um, yeah, it's the sort of the evil inclination that God tries to wipe out, but, but fails to wipe out. Okay? Um, Okay, but, but, but between Eden and the flood, there is uh, the first sin when Cain kills Abel. Although I think it's interesting that like the first act of violence in Genesis is not Cain killing Abel, but Abel sacrificing the sheep. That's the first act of violence in Genesis. Um, that's also true, right? Um, Cain is you know, sent out into the world for a sin. It's this mark of Cain, but he's marked with a sign of protection. Now, the next slide I want to show is a bit of a Genesis deep cut, I think, um, but I think it's pretty key to the book. Um, and so here I want to talk about one of Cain's descendants named Lamech, who brags, uh, brags to his wives that, um, about how, like, how um, murder is great. So, um, so uh, I have slain a man for wounding me and a lad for bruising me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Um, here I think that like we have Cain's descendant Lamech misinterpreting or maybe properly interpreting the import of Cain's story. That here's violence upon the world now. Lamech I think understands violence to be loosed upon the world, to be but to be excusable and maybe even natural part of life. Okay, this is also interesting. So Lamech's descendants are named. Here's some genealogy stuff like deep deep cuts. Right? Okay, so um, we have Jabal, the ancestor of those who live in tents and have livestock. We have Jubal, the ancestor of those who played a liar in the pipe and Tubal Cain, who made bronze and iron tools. It's like the invention of the economy, arts, technology, right here. Okay, right? Um, and Lamech is probably I, probably the first poet in the Bible, too, in terms of like, you know, depending how you shape out some of the language, but yeah, the first poet, too. Um, so, okay, I have some images from Lachan, right? Um, and the murder that closes this film is like not a climax so much as the kind of consequence of the circulation of the banknotes. And I have two images I think that kind of like show what comes into being in Lajon. Like the one on the right here is the Photoshop owner who accepts the counterfeit notes and asserts that he will pass them on. This idea of circulation, this, this thing circulating. Right? 
And I really can't resist sharing a small moment, which happened shortly after the scene in the middle of the slide here, which the bit part of the school teacher really like has this great line that shows us a shift of like, um, we going from like a, a, this economy of grace and what it came to the first miracle in the Gospel of John, which like it's just free gift of wine, right? right? Um, and we have that shift from the economy of grace to the economy of scarcity and envy, envy happening in one place right here, right? Um, and then like ends in the culmination of murderous rampage. Um, I, I really appreciate yesterday Carl's presentation. I thought about this a lot. Oh, is, is, Carl, is Carl here still there? Yeah, yeah. So it's, um, thinking about money as the visible God. I talked a little bit about this with you afterwards, as like the kind of like pure sign of human interaction, right? and, um, the pure abstraction of human life. But like the idea of the visible God's counterpoint is like the hidden God, right? Okay, the hidden God, um, which can bring us to Jansenism, as Jonathan requests me to talk about. All right, so, um, so actually, I have a bit of a bit of trouble sometimes figuring out what like Jansenist means when they talk about him. Because like, you know, is it just like when someone's calls someone a Philistine? I mean, like, do I really have to, you know, like, what is it really relevant what a Philistine really is? But like, um, um, but like, you know, is it just mean like, oh, he's austere and religious and maybe moralizing about human sin? Or is it maybe a worthwhile category? I'm like, I, okay, that quote from Godard, which I read before, but I'd kind of forgotten, I saw where he calls um, a Jansenist an inquisitor. I don't like that inquisitor. I don't know. I don't know. No, I think that's not right. Okay. Um, but let me, I think there is something about the Jansenist idea. I'll get to it in a second. Um, so the, the concept of that's most associated with Jansenism, uh, original sin, this is the August, Augustinian insistence on inevitability of sin and human inability to do the good. I mean, that's there in Brisson's film, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think maybe um, more analytically useful is this notion of the hidden God. So okay, this, this notion, it's a Jansenist notion, Augustinian, is that there's an incommensurate gap between the divine and the human realm, right? And um, this gap is like unbridgeable. And it's about like transgression and sin and ethics, but it's also about knowledge, right? And this gap means that like, we don't know a thing about the divine. We don't know anything about it. Um, um, and, and this is a great, great quote from Brisson when he said in an interview where he, he said, I really do believe that our life is made up of both predestination and chance. And like from the perspective of humans, like predestination and chance, it's the same thing. Like that's the same thing, right? This is like, um, you know nothing, right? Um, so, I mean, all we can know about is that Brisson said about his films, like, if there is a human presence, this is a quote from Brisson, right? if there is a human presence, there's also a presence of the divine. Okay, so a couple final set of images from Enfant um, I want to suggest that these sort of like ellipses through which a kind of grace or a moment of grace, and at least is a really great talk um, yesterday, uh, can emerge is, is, I think, in the realm of art, right? Okay, this is like where the like, grace happens in art and like art and, and creation, I think, like creation more broadly, right? Again, I want to emphasize that biblical narrative is not mimetic reportage. It's like it's literary art. Like it's a, it's a, it's a effective techniques to create something. And I think you know, uh, Brisson's films, of course, res resist mimesis too. Um, and you know, uh, Brisson wrote that he wants the camera to be a tool of creation. He said in the interview, sorry, um, rather than, rather than a tool of reproduction. And in the story of creation in Genesis itself, the narrative is it's not again, it's not a report. It's a literary imagination. It's an occasion for contemplation. It opens itself opens these spaces up. And I'm also thinking a lot about a distinction that Jonathan made yesterday about how um, we, we see what the early Brisson, late Brisson, about like we see context work in the early Brisson, right? And then text work in the, the late, late, late Brisson. Um, and I've been definitely employing later works and text work here. So I'm like definitely like doing this, right? Um, and I, but this distinction has been bothering me, not because I'm wrong, because I think it's right, I think, right, so far. Um, um, I mean, have I been like engaging in mystification and adherence to the kind of like party line of Sontag, Trader, Bosnia? I don't know, like, right? Um, uh, maybe, I mean, sure, I don't know. Um, but I still think the distinction is kind of interesting, the, the early context, late text, it's interesting. Um, because I think the, the, um, the context work is essential, don't get me wrong, it's essential historical work, which is about truly understanding how this art and how this artist emerged, right? That's absolutely essential, right? Um, text work also, I think, has a really cool role because t text work is about form. I think it's about form, um, which is maybe ahistorical, but like that's the point, right? Okay. Um, since, you know, form is the place, I, I would argue, is from where futurity emerges. Like, this is where form, Artistic form is where new things happen. Um, uh, literary form, cinematic, cinematic form, it enables us to imagine the world as it different what it could be. I mean, as it could be different than what it is now. Excuse me. 
Now, like, notwithstanding the bleakness of Brisson's later films, like, he definitely, he consistently, Brisson consistently insisted that he was not a pessimist, which I love, right? Like, um, uh, rather, I think the starkness of his vision articulates something to a kind of like, I don't know, negative utopia, Ernst Bloch, not yet kind of thing. Um, maybe that's a bit much, but okay. Um, uh, further, I think the distinctiveness uh, and rigor of Brisson style and its commitment to a clear eyed confrontation with the, with the world, and this confrontation doesn't, neither denies its horrors nor forecloses its possibility for transformation. I think this style suggests that aesthetic form can be a ground from which new potentialities can emerge. I don't, I don't think form is, form is not a prison, or rather, I guess the prison of form is the kind of prison that creates the condition of its own escape, right? Um, both Brisson and the Book of Genesis, they may be clear-eyed about human darkness um, and of the prison of human sin, but, but no prison can stop the wind from blowing away. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, that was fantastic. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Is this on? Is it working there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, would someone like to start the questions from the floor? Richard. Yeah. Pass the microphone. Oh, it was so fantastic. Uh, the two. Th like the diptych, I've I've always like really struggled to imagine what Genesis would have been about. You know, it's because how well, best someone would have done it because everything else is so focused. And I think, how have you done it? And then Richard and Townsend did this thing, and I suddenly thought, oh, I can I can see what this might be now all of a sudden. And then Sean's thing makes me think, well, he made it. He, yeah. he did. Yeah. And so it's almost like I, I I want you to talk to each other and and, and say, could, you know, can can you see what it would be? And, 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 and are, you, are you still excited and think, oh, if only he'd made it? Or, or do you feel in some ways, because maybe, maybe some great project shouldn't be made. Often art, the, the thing that artists say they want to make is the one that, in a way, they, they didn't need to be made. But do you, do you still anchor after the idea of, of, of what Genesis could have been or not? Like, I think you're in um, Sean's talk. I think up until that point, I felt disappointed that Genesis wasn't made in, in the 60s, but now I'm really, really happy it wasn't because I think if he had made it in the 80s, it would have been a way more interesting film, I think. Or if oh, yeah, indeed yeah, yeah, it had yeah. been, yeah. if it or this idea that it is actually already made and embedded in all his films yeah. is way more interesting than actually, especially with the hands of Dino De Laurentiis. <laughs> <laughs> There's also something really so beautiful about researching something that never quite came to be. And the fact that he was like throughout his life, it was a sort of thread. Um, but yeah, it never came. <laughs> it was just this kind of desire that was never fulfilled. Mm -hmm. That's part, I think that's partly what intrigues me about it. For sure. <laughs> I still would love to have seen it. Like, 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 <laughs> even, even artists that have like, that do variations of theme, you still want to see the next theme, right? You, you know, it's still going along the line to see the opening day, right? You know? Um, no, oh, yeah. I mean, these are these are just fragments. These are just fragments, right? So like, I don't fill it out. Yeah. That is a lot of that. So uh, remind me, uh, the Loyola project was a project from the late '40s, and he wanted to work with uh, Julien Green, and that didn't come to pass. When was the Princesse de Clèves project? Do you remember? No. And when did he start working on Genesis? The, well, that, that early version, I guess, would have been like 61 or 62, like after Joan of Arc was, was wrapped, I think. And, after Joan yeah, of Arc, yeah, he started yeah. working on it. And then, I mean, it was absolutely fascinating, all these details about it. Just one uh, small note, Visconti uh, spent time in, in France in the 1930s. He was an assistant to Jean Renoir and Tony. And it is quite possible that they met already in the 1930s. Mm. Amazing. Thank you very much. That was um, absolutely brilliant. And it's been really great the last two days. Can you hear me? I'm not sure if I'm doing it right. Okay. Yeah, very well, but, uh, okay. I'll, do, I'll go a bit louder. 
Um, what I'd like to, what I've been thinking a lot about um, this notion of what, you know, Bresson has been doing, and I come not with great knowledge at all, none of, of, of his of, and apart from bits and pieces of seeing odd films when I was much younger. And, um, but what's, um, I found really interesting has been, um, something that Sean said um, just in passing in, in your talk, which was, he, he gave, he, I'm going to give two quotes. One, he says, um, a camera is the tool for creation. And, and then the other quote was a bit later when he said um, that there was something about the ground from where new potentialities emerge. The and second one was not, the second one was me, that was not Brazon. <laughs> oh, wasn't it? So, well, it was just, so it, interesting, yeah. Okay, so, but this was, so for me, this is really interesting because um, I've been sort of thinking that possibly because of the role of repetition, which was discussed yesterday, and, um, you know, the fact that repetition is sort of equivalent to rhythms, which is what somebody pointed out this morning, and these sort of rhythms and repetitions can almost, um, when they're mindless, you know, you sort of create these spaces, the, the space that is the transformative potential space um, where creativity occurs. And so I think in my thinking of what I've heard the last two days is that, um, could it be that uh, Bresson was working not in a kind of narrative, aspect of, of filmmaking, but much more in the notion of um, working in the space between things and about almost making moving stills. You know, the fact that the camera um, is a, a tool of translation and, and also it acts as a catalyst and sort of part, you know, what, what you don't see, the camera knows things, sees things that we don't, and kind of enlarges them or exaggerates them. And, and we perform, or people perf perform for the camera in ways that they may not, so that you, you, you find, you know, Bart's edos. Anyway, it's just a thought. I don't know if anyone wants to um, comment on that. Well, okay, something that occurred to me is that, you know, um, uh, depending on your Bibles, I'm sorry, Bibles, um, uh, the, the Genesis 1 through 11 is like 10 pages long. Like, and one of those pages is genealogy, right? So like, yeah, there's like, like a lot happens and like, there's a lot of spaces, right? Like, like it's, it's like barely a narrative. Like, it's really, really a narrative. Yeah, so I, that's what I think. Like, there's, like, there's a lot of space for things to happen in between those spots. I think you touched on something. I think it's kind of a long-standing desire, isn't there, amongst novelists and artists of all sorts to make work that gets rid of the subject or drama and becomes contemplative or sufficient unto itself formally. And I think he there's a, there's that impetus in Bresson's work. I mean, as Jeanette pointed out yesterday, it's difficult to do that, and also it, it both just what will that be? We're still looking, but also it's difficult to do it commercially. So we have to continue putting. It seems in, in cinema you have to carry on uh, using some story. Um, uh, Bresson, I think, minimizes it and tries to make make films that are as much as possible around rhythms and form and creating collaborative space, if you like, in in, in determining meaning. But he certainly chooses narratives or yeah, the, the, the congenial Dostoevsky, the Bible. And clearly, there's a calling from these spiritual religious texts as well. So that I, there's a tension, isn't there, and a paradox there. But I certainly think he's driving towards exactly what you're saying, but you know, hadn't finished that journey of working out quite what it would be. But I certainly think we might want to think more about his films um, in terms of making a kind of a, a, 
an emotional response, but if you like an emotional response to the form rather than to this rather traditional dramatic stuff. I care about this character with a certain set of intentions rather than I am somehow contemplating a, an artifact that's coherent and bound together and total. It's like a painting that lasts for 90 minutes. That might be the way we might want to think about some of these films. I also think about the Joan of Arc film is, is about, it's, it's responding to these transcripts, like trial transcripts. That's a very kind of formal choice of everything. Uh, but I, I think um, that that um, that that kind of uh, comment of, of Bresson making moving stills, or the idea of like the ninety-minute painting, really relates to my question to the panel earlier about, and and to Elise's comment yesterday about us working in this gap between the still and the moving, and the photographer and the filmmaker, and sort of Bresson as we heard from day one being in that gap as well. So it's kind of interesting. We've kind of come back to the first session <laughs> <laughs> via two days of journey. I, I just want to, I think um, what I was meant to say as well, which um, was just the, the last presentation, this idea of um, Genesis as a potential project, you know, something that is unfinished and but is also has potential to, to be made into something new by um, Tamsin and um, Richard and um, so for me that was a perfect kind of um, ex illustration of of that so no, thank you <laughs> would like to um, yeah um, to bring the f uh, to Sarah and then to John at the front Sarah hi hi it's just a short question for Tamsin and Richard um, Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Okay. It's just a um, little kind of question about whether, because to me, there's a, you know, in the idea of Genesis, there is a idea of world making, and that's what a filmmaker does. And do you think that kind of reflexive um, element was at play in his interest in making that film? Well, I really like that interview that we read out about this, just like this idea of like beginnings of things, like, and the kind of potentials in that. Um, yeah, that seems very Personian to me somehow. <laughs> Maybe not in world making in a kind of grand, like, um, bombastic sense, but like, yeah, just an intrigue about how things would start. Make, making a movie could be a real pain, but you really feel <laughs> that he and Charbonnier were probably having a lot of fun. I mean, yeah. they did know each other very, they were very yeah. close friends. Yeah. I bet they were having a lot of fun and thinking, oh, God, I've got to go make a movie now. Well. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did, because um, we've been trying, we've been trying to make this book for, I think this is like the sixth year. And last year, we keep on adding folders to our folders. And last mm -hmm. year, it was like uh, 20, 2020 like to FFS <laughs> like normal and then now we're making 2023 and we were like well maybe this book is actually going to be like Genesis that it actually like <laughs> it just stays in this state of like maybe maybe not Older maybe than folders. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah can, can I just pick up on the term that's been used Brass on talking and it's, it's you used it today and it was used yesterday which is the claim that he's an optimist is that Bresson's language? Because, I mean, can I, I just, can, I, can I just fill it out a little sure. bit? Right, because I've, I've always found that the contrast of optimism and pessimism is, pre, is not a very helpful one. Right, so, so I always like, there's a really bad joke, which is what's the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? And the answer is the optimist thinks it's the best of all possible worlds and the pessimist agrees. <laughs> right, <laughs> and, 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 and it always strikes me that, that that's not the right, the right contrast is one of hope and despair. Right, and when you think, when you and and if you're actually thinking in terms of the sources that Bresson's talking about, they seem to be the better contrast mm. than thinking of optimism and pessimism. And I just, and if you think of the virtues, I mean, it's hope is the virtue. It's not optimism, right? Optimism is what an idiot like Boris Johnson's got. I mean, it's. <laughs> like... <laughs> I, I I recall, and I, I stripped out some of the citations it's for reading purposes, but I, I recall that he was there an interview. I think, but like denied that he was a pessimist. Or didn't he didn't assert optimistic, but like denied the pessimism. That's, so maybe, that, maybe that's an important distinction. I don't know. I think I think it is yeah. because I mean I mean 
the op I mean, I think the, the interesting concept is the concept of hope, and that's the one about the potentialities, is that there's still hope. Right, and that's what you're talking about, rather than whether you're optimistic. I mean, it, it, there's also quotes, there's Gramsci, you know, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will and so on. But there's, I, I'm not, I just, I'm not convinced of that contrast, really. So pessimism is, I think, maybe, optim I mean, hope is much, much more interesting. Or, or my favorite Kafka quote, where he doesn't say like there's hope, infinite hope, but not for us. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, um, Notes on cinematography is a book of hope, isn't it? It's like, this is the future of this medium. There is going to be this amazing art form and it's going to communicate these things. And it, it feels very optimistic in, in that. Yes, way. I mean, at one point he says, the stuff that people make now in 50 years time will think it's just nonsense and we're getting close to 50 years now. I'm not sure we're quite. <laughs> but yes, I think you had an optimistic sense of the, the future of a young medium which had been led astray, mm. perhaps in biblical terms, and, uh, and that there was huge potential uh, in it. Yeah, it's not like a, a book of criticism of what exists, it's, but it's like a, yeah, an ambition for what could exist. I, I just remember just a thing uh, that he said in an interview, I'm not pessimist, but a happy pessimist. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so that is yeah, his yeah, terms, yeah, he's, so he's yeah, using those yeah, like I that really language. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that, he okay. was interested. Would anyone else like to ask a, a question? Yeah, at the back with Sally. Let me grab the chance. A question for anyone on the panel and uh, Sally Shafto. Um, do you think that um, Bresson had got to a point where he'd thought he had recreated cinema, whatever, and wanted to recreate the world? <laughs> <laughs> oh, could you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think he'd um, had enough of recreating cinema or cinema whatever and wanted to recreate the world? Uh, I'm actually not an expert on, on Genesis, uh, so I think I'm going to give this over to, to the panel. <laughs> We could pass it on to the chair who knew him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think he felt he'd completed the journey of working out cinema. Um, I think he felt Largeon still had plenty of problems. Um, I'm not, yeah, I mean, the Genesis project, I'm not sure it's about recreating the world. I mean, it's true that that's the, the story he was inhabiting, but I think it was, uh, again, just congenial territory in which to, to drop his characters. Um, it's a pretty profound subject. Do you really think it was just a place to drop his characters? Well, congenial territory. I mean, if he chose it, I think it was, of course, it was interesting to him, but I'm not sure he had a, the sense that somehow that was the, mm, the final step on that on a journey, or that was somehow that, that was somehow creating you know, creating a world, liberating him from having to continue the work. I mean, but I don't. It's a profound question. I haven't had time to think it through deeply. I do know he didn't feel he cracked cinematography in Laos. Um, and you know, I, he was going to make this very small film when Genesis didn't happen. So I think he still had the sense that there were small subjects, other films to make. Um, and of course, he'd been thinking about Genesis since the sixties. Had he made it then, would there not have been? The films that came afterwards that where there were still imperfections and a lot of a lot of learning and development to undergo but a fascinating thought just to switch from genesis to itself um the, the last little project which we actually haven't talked about at all which is a wonderful film didn't that also be back to the 1940s Last 40s or 50s, I think the 50s maybe, yeah. Oh, 1950s. And there was a version when I think he was going to make that with Natalie Wood and um, Burt Lancaster. So, you know, oh, he, again, what, 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 what did you just say? He was thinking of Burt Lancaster? Yeah, and Natalie oh, Wood, yeah. Right, right, right. Another a part of his continued, you know, uh, sense of enterprise, finding ways to make, to make the film. Right, right, right. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of, as with uh, the, the casting in Genesis, he was very thoughtful around how do you cast Lancelot? This is, a, this is a story that comes from, well, several different cultures. And how do you find authentic or appropriate casting from within that milieu? Steve, ask them something, ask them something. <laughs> Just ap apropos, um, is this, can you hear me? Yes. Apropos Lancelot's lack, the, the sound of the uh, clanking of the, uh, 
of of the it's amazing and and it and it links with what i was saying yesterday i just leave you with that it's very dreamy very strange yeah. this kind of medieval characters with this sort of strangely modern uh, sound of clinking um yeah, armor I, th I think in terms of what we were just talking about from Sal's question, I think calling your films attempts, I think tells you a lot. Oh, sorry. I was just thinking of Sal's question and I think referring to your films as attempts, I think kind of like relates to this and this idea of like being able to crack it or not being able to crack it. It's like, I'm going to try, I'm going to try, I'm going to try. And it's not like I did it. Now I'm going to do it again. Now I'm going to do it again. There's, that, you know, I think that tells you so much about the way he was thinking and working. And I think uh, Roger's anecdote from yesterday about um, Bresson spending, um, you know, one of the afternoons just telling the students everything that was wrong with his films. Um, yeah, I, I think partly answers that question as well, maybe. One last question. Ben. Uh, I thought the um, narrative evocation or the theory of narrative that goes into the genesis uh, was very interesting from the point of view of it being a description of the Brisson film style. You know, he, he, he adds, and the and and the end and the end is the sequencing and chaining of short sequences the interstices between something we hear or something we see are the silences that are implicit in what goes in between the descriptions of the events so from that point of view one could say that the film genesis was um a type of um creation that was also implicit in the other films because the other films are using the narrative style of genesis to tell its stories about the frailties of humans that the genesis text was already quite familiar with uh, so the idea that Genesis needed to be made in the early 60s, it strikes me as if one could say that it was in some sense not necessary because of the films that got made after Genesis was supposed to have been made. They all talk about the downfall of man and they use the Genesis style. They just don't have a flood and they don't have a Tower of Babel. <laughs> they just have fake money and greedy merchants and and uh expressible but ultimately indecipherable donkeys i of course agree with that <laughs> <laughs> i also think it's like still strangely too good to be true like but yeah but yeah, yeah of course it's strange yeah. i mean but, there is a flood i mean like does the flood after in, in balthazar yeah, but yeah, it's, uh, well, I mean, not a worldwide flood, but a big pour downpour. There's a potential flood in the yeah. devil, probably, isn't there? Yeah. Which is, you know, this is what the, they're trying to, to, to stop. Yeah, the, the ecological <laughs> flood, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one more. Am I on? One more, one more question. Let's pass it along and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, just a quick one to go back to the pessimism. It's considering he was a real Christian, then. I don't understand now how he could be a pessimism because in in the end there's life there's death if you really believe and it's something death is something positive unless you mean that through the glances of his films he's casting a light and the hopelessness because of the way that we behave or the societies that we've that have come about yeah sean do you want to address that i mean i would say it's interesting isn't it? because you have obviously a number of films that end end with death here and we might want to attribute agency and some kind of i don't know redemption in those moments but uh sean i mean a big thing in pascal is you just don't know which way you're going right like that like that's that's so i so i mean I, I, it's not an automatic positive right like you know you, you don't know and so, so but there is this that sort of potentiality the possibility 
even in death. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's just because he is a Christian, so he believes. So he must believe, or maybe he doesn't. Is that what you mean? Well, I mean, also, I think that, like, yeah, I, I guess I'm leaning on this um, Augustinian, Jansenist idea that, like, there's predestination, and you don't know which camp you're in. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm pushing that too far, but yeah. It just occurs to me that maybe Dostoevsky maybe gave him all that he needed. Uh, um, did it, the most religious of the great novels, and, and, and all the big books end yeah. badly on the face of Warren Best to go to Siberia. But that's a tough, tough optimism. Yeah. So maybe, because there's bits he picked out, Sean, though, mainly from the Dostoevsky adaptation. Yeah, so I just that's think, cool. Uh, that's my <laughs> Thank you. Am I on? No. All righty. I think we're going to. Uh, I think we're going to wrap up. First of all, let's thank these guys hugely. <laughs> I don't really know what to say in finishing off. I mean, it's been a humbling two days. I turned up thinking I knew something, although not very much. And I'm going home thinking I know quite a lot, but only a tiny corner of a, a world that's got an awful lot bigger, but much more exciting. It's been an extraordinary couple of days. I've felt I've learned a huge amount. I've been surprised at every turn and uh, the contributions have been extraordinary. And we, ha we haven't gone down that, the old roots of you know, the transcendental and it's, a, it's been extraordinarily refreshing and engaging two days. Uh, which is testament to the, the quality of the people who have, have spoken, many of you out there have spoken, and of course to the presence of all of you and the, the, the quality of uh, the questions we've had and the conversations that have gone on around here. It feels like it's been very congenial, enjoyable, uh, open session. So thank you to all of you. Um, Richard Townsend, you want to sign off in some way? Yeah, it's been great. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say here, here for the organizers and for I think for the staff and <laughs> <laughs>